everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Chuck Price is a lawyer by trade, but a wisdom seeker by nature. His openness and curiosity led him down a most unusual path, a path towards greater personal authenticity, presence, and awareness. He's written a book called Rewiring the White Collar Mind. Now he talks to other professionals about finding your way in a linear left brain profession while holding on to your humanity along the way. Charles, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, so my name is Charles Price. I go by Chuck. Uh, I'm a lawyer in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and I've just published a book called Rewiring the White Collar Mind, and it basically tells my story. Um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about the book in more detail. Um, I, I would say there were um, probably two big turning points for me in my professional and, and personal development One, as I describe in detail in the book, was going to a psychiatrist in Santa Barbara uh, when I was uh, in my late teens. Uh, And my presenting symptom, as they say, was that I had this blinding headache for two years, basically. And he quickly observed that I had a lot of reason to be angry in my life, but I was completely disconnected from that. And and that was the beginning of kind of an insight uh, that there was a whole area of my life that I had not been in touch with my, my emotions, especially sort of negative, dark emotions and so on. So that was a turning point. Um, and probably the other big one was when I, uh, had, uh, my first daughter with my ex-wife and we now have three daughters together. Uh, and I, it quickly became evident to me that although I was totally devoted to these kids and really wanted the best for them, I didn't have all the tools that I realized I needed to be a good dad. And I was going to have to do some growing up alongside of them to be the father that I wanted to be. What kind of tools do you think you were lacking? I think the most important thing you can impart to kids uh, is just a sense that they are basically okay, basically worthy, um, and that your affection for them, your love for them is not conditional. That wasn't the message I got in my family. That's probably true more or less for a lot of people. Um, but it was fairly extreme in, in my family, um, both because I was you know, quite successful in school and athletics and a lot of other things. And so I, I got a lot of positive reinforcement for that. And then my family just never talked about emotions, particularly neg- negative emotions. I mean, really to a pretty extreme de- degree. Um, so I think that's the that's the most important thing you can impart to kids is, you know, you're crying, you're upset. I get it. These things happen. You'll be all right. Um, and I see my, my middle daughter has two wonderful kids, my grandkids, and she's raising them very much that way. And I've given her a lot of praise for that. Well, I think our professional schools really encourage a left brain approach to life. But if you are awake, as you get older, you realize that it's really the experiential events that have the deepest, most transcendent meaning. How do we balance that out with the knowledge you need for a profession and the need for connection to a greater humanity? Boy, what a great question, Pat. And that's really kind of the overarching theme of my book uh, is is precisely that, that we, um, we are taught in our professional schools to be uh, rational and to engage in this intellectual process and uh, to engage that left side of our brain. And we, we learn all these skills. For example, in law school, um, I point out to law students uh, that you are being taught to study cases, what we call precedent, uh, which is looking backwards. Uh, and we are taught to strategize, which is looking forwards, but we're never taught to live right now. And when I say that to a room of law students, you can just see the light bulb go off. They're like, that's true. 
I, I know that you're supposed to live now and live in the moment, as they say, but you're never taught that in law school. And in fact, everything that we learn in our professional training uh, teaches you away from the things that you need to learn for what we sometimes loosely call life balance. And we can talk a little bit about my, my attitude about life balance, which I think is a little bit of a misleading term. Um, uh, but the point of my book is we have to not reject our professional training, but to put it in its proper place, to understand that we have now all of these great left brain skills. That's wonderful. But don't mistake those for a template for life itself. Uh, if you if you try to you know take all of those lawyer skills and apply them to everything in your life or doctor skills or accounting or engineering, whatever it might be, um, you're just not covering the field of all the skills that you need. And as I say, in many cases, you're being taught away from the things that you need to have a really balanced, contented life. What is life balance? Great question. Okay, so I, I'm all for the idea of life balance in some ways. I, I think the term life balance um, has a certain potential toxicity to it. You can mistake that for saying, if you want to have a balanced life, you should work less hours and you know do more in your free time and so on. Um, and the implicit model there is that your work life is difficult and stressful and bad, and therefore you need to balance it out with something that's good on, in your, on the personal side. And what I try to gently urge my readers toward uh, is a model that says, <coughs> Let's look for balance in every moment of our life uh, rather than saying there's some bad stuff over here. I'm going to balance out with good stuff over there. What would it really be like to be completely connected and present uh, in, in all moments of your life? And so that the balance that we all want to feel is something you can feel throughout the day in whatever environment. I think part of it is aligning your internal motivation with your professional goals. And so often the two are at opposite ends of the spectrum. How do you bring that into alignment? Like in medicine, um, your goal is not to have an MD. Your goal should be something deeper, more motivating to help people. But so often I think that the more human, uh, the more human goal is overlooked. A hundred percent. I, In in my talks to professionals, um, I always ask them, um, let's have kind of a a discussion about why you went to medical school, why you went to law school, what was your ultimate idea? Uh, And you get a variety of answers, of course, and people will say, um, I wanted to help people and I wanted to serve humanity and so on. And typically, either nobody mentions money uh, or <laughs> it takes a while to get to that, but that's obviously a factor. Okay. Uh, and then I say, okay, so now we got five or six things up on the board here. Um, what is it that you're trying to achieve with those things? If you had a sense of serving humanity and, and making a good living and all these other things that are positive, um, what would you get out of that? And the point of that discussion is to basically say, um, I went to professional school because I wanted to have a balanced, contented life. Like, okay, that's that, that all tracks. Now, is that really something that you're learning? What you're actually learning to do is to have an extremely unbalanced life, totally left brain and totally based on what you're going to accomplish at some point in the future. I will get through this, uh, the grind of medical school and the grind of a residency, because at some point I'll be able to have you know a medical practice and everything will be fine. And what you're actually doing is training yourself to look to the future, to be the place where you will be happy. And so I see one professional after another not living their life in the present, looking forward to some golden age when they'll be happy in the future. And I think that's an inherent outcome of professional training and experience unless we consciously rewire ourselves, as I advocate in the book. I think in the book you mentioned Eckhart Tolle, too, who's obviously very keen on living in the present moment. But everything in our society pushes us in a different, it pushes us in an external direction. And if we're living in, in response to external things, the bauble du jour, as I call it, 
we're totally negating the incredible depth and importance of that that which lies within. Okay, so a couple of things there. Uh, I, I love Eckhart Tolle. I think he's a real master. But I will say that as I read his book, uh, The Power of Now, um, I had this feeling that he was sort of talking about um, the history of mindfulness and the philosophy of mindfulness, but he wasn't really giving me, you know, real concrete uh, ideas of how to implement that in today's busy world. Um, and I actually went to see him speak at UCLA. I drove probably eight hours each way to see him. So I, I, I really wanted to see him speak. And it was kind of funny. He walked out on stage and said, boy, that LA traffic is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so so I, I, I realized, you know, there's, there's no way to kind of just rise above all this stuff and just kind of float in this sort of Zen existence, no matter who you are, including if you're Eckhart Tolle. So that's, that's one piece of it. And I wanted to have a, a more practical approach in my book. Exactly what does it mean to be a mindful lawyer? Does that mean you're just floating above everything and nothing bothers you? Not at all. Um, and then the idea about the messages we get from our, uh, uh, from our culture, from our society, social media, advertising, and so on, um, the, the predominant message is you are not okay because you need the thing that I'm selling you. <laughs> That's the model. Uh, and, and you're not okay now, but you might be okay in the future. So everything sets you up for a state of perpetual anxiety. That's the message you're getting all the time. And uh, unless you're really mindful of that and really start to filter those things out, put them in perspective, put yourself on a media diet and so on, but most of all, just being really mindful and conscious about these things, you're headed for trouble because that's how the whole system is set up, is to keep you in a perpetual state of um, uneasiness, anxiety, a sense of incompleteness. Um, and that's how you're going to feel unless you rewire all that. How do you find mindfulness? It's really, um, it's, it's a practice. It's the good news is that you can decide to start practicing it at, at every moment. Um, and I think it's important to have some understanding of what mindfulness is. I think the people who are truly mindful are probably those people who've attained some state of enlightenment and as a result of, you know, years of practice and so on. I don't pretend to have attained that. But I will say that um, you have to have some basic understanding of what, what mindfulness would look like. And it's not a sense of detachment. If I'm mindful, these things wouldn't bother me. It's a sense of full engagement, of full observation of exactly what's going on right now, including all of your reactions to what's going on, uh, including what we sometimes think of as the negative, as well as what we sometimes think of as the positive. Um, and so rather than, as I, as I say in the book, um, enlightenment is not Novocaine. It is not a, a, a way to go through life and not feel the pain and the disappointment and the frustration of life. We all know at some level that's just an inherent aspect of life. But we all we, we constantly trick ourselves into thinking if I just find some technique, then you know I can go through life more smoothly and not suffer. Um, Pema Chodron, a great Buddhist nun, tells the story of when she sort of converted to Buddhism and she was talking to, I think, her aunt uh, about this new religion. And, and I think her aunt was from the Jewish tradition. And she said, well, tell me about this Buddhism. And Pema Chodron said, well, um, the, the basic idea of Buddhism is that all life is suffering. And the aunt said, okay, stop. I've heard enough. That's a great religion. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a meditation practice? Yeah, I do. I, I meditate every day um, when I when I wake up, um, and it's it's so funny, Pat. I, I I really I've done it for many years now, and it almost always takes me two or three minutes to even start to calm that chattering mind. 
you know, I hear this nice voice of let's get into our posture and let's breathe and everything. And that's kind of going on over here. And then I'm going on, uh, you know, in my, my own, in my own mind, it's like, you know, if that player had just caught that interception, I would have covered the spread <laughs> and <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, some work thing, you know, and it's just this. So, and, and that's part of mindfulness is just observing that we have this constantly chattering mind. And rather than saying, that's terrible, I wish I could cure that. It's like, nope, that's, that's part of life. That's just how we're wired. So just being able to observe that um, and then also to observe that we are able to um, accept that, embrace it, and then calmly come back to, if you're medita- meditating, it might be the breathing, um, or it might be, okay, now I can kind of accept, bless, and release, and turn back to my work project, or being with my grandkids, whatever the case might be. Um, so I think it's important to not view your meditation as an escape from your life, uh, but as a, as a setup for living your life in a certain way. How did you get into meditation? Well, let's see. I did, I did transcendental meditation when I was young um, and um, did that for several years um, and then kind of got back to meditation later in life. So it's always been something that I kind of understood as a necessary practice. It's sort of like a golfer going to the driving range. It's just practicing the set of skills that you need. Um, so as a result of the kind of reading that I do, there's just a lot of reference to mindfulness and meditation and so on. So it's always been something that's uh, been a part of my life. I think meditation can be a real game changer. And the reason, the, the most basic reason I believe that is it is experiential. It allows you to experience peace. It's not intellectual. It's not in your left brain. And I think once you have that experience or that range of experiences, you know it's real, and now you can bring it into the rest of your life. That experiential aspect of meditation is totally game-changing. Yeah, that's a really deep comment. Um, And it particularly applies to us white-collar professionals who are taught a totally left-brain-oriented way of approaching things. Um, You know, Here's the client's problem. Let's read some cases about this. Let's formulate a strategy. All left brain stuff. And what we forget is that we are wired as human beings. If if we truly achieve our potential, it has to be done at a deeper level than that. It has to be done at a level of experience and depth below, you know, beyond the words. I've, I've got a couple of chapters in Rewiring the White Collar Mind about beyond numbers and beyond words. You know, what, what exists beneath all of that and beyond all of that? Um, and it's, what, you know, what does it feel like to really experience something? Um, and I think unless we really rewire our professional minds We'll never get there. We've got to understand that we've been given a template for professional success, but also for personal misery, unless we take control of that, integrate it with something, and combine that all into a package that works for us. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think the the, the bliss and the wonder and the fun of life lies in that right brain experience. And it's so available to all of us. Sometimes you find it in a sport. Maybe you find it cooking or knitting. It isn't something um, esoteric or elusive at all. It's just something that I think you have to prime your brain to look for and to and to experience. Yeah, I played in a 12-piece rhythm and blues band for 25 years. Uh, and even though we had several lawyers in the band, we were all able to do exactly what you're talking about, to just be totally present, totally reactive to what we were hearing from the others. Um, and and I will say that's unusual for lawyers who are in bands. Typically, typically lawyer bands are, number one, way too loud. 
Um, <laughs> number two, kind of a, a combination of uh, individual efforts that don't integrate very well. We happen to, you know, be very lucky that you know everybody in in our band, um, which was called the Repeat Offenders, we played for many years in Phoenix. Uh, everybody understood that it's a collective group enterprise, um, and that you have to be completely present and non ego driven to really. Um, put out the the group product that we were all proud of. It's funny you talk about being ego-driven. I used to fly high-performance sailplanes, and I mm. remember one incident one day. Um, a lot, it's really about managing energy. And as you get good at it, you could manage your energy so you land and you stop the plane just right in the saddle uh, for the trailer that it goes into. You know, the wings come mm. out and everything else. And after a while, it becomes almost second nature. You have to be very present to do it. But I remember flying one day, and among the people flying was a gentleman from another club. And he was convinced he was just, you know, a sky god. So he lands, and he rolls up the field, and he rolls um, up towards his trailer, but he wasn't managing his energy very well. He was really in his ego, not in the moment. And boom, the poor plane and the wings slam right into the back of the trailer, doing I don't know how many thousands of dollars worth of damage. But more importantly, his ego was really damaged. Yeah, and I would bet that his ego response was some kind of deflection. The reason that happened was not because I wasn't present and and focused. It was some external factor. Did you get to that point of finding out why, what, what he sort of blamed it on? No, everybody just kind of looked and shook their head and turned away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, uh, but that's, you know, that, that whole kind of ego orientation, you know, you you do see that in lawyers, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> and, and and you can immediately tell if somebody is wired to get the job done or if they're wired to look good. Um, and, and, if, and for people who are wired to, you know, be the smartest person in the room and, you know, always have the right answer and so on, uh, it just really interferes with client service. For obvious reasons, you're not you're not really focusing on exactly what's happening now and how to land the plane safely and smoothly. But you know what what do people think of me? And so you're really chasing two rabbits at the same time. Um, and I, I have a chapter in the book talking about would I hire me as a lawyer? What what we are looking for if we are a client is a lawyer who is present and focused and self confident at a deep level and so on. And all these ego games, clients don't look for that. I really want a client who's totally into the, a lawyer who's really into their ego and and self absorbed and insecure and everything. That's that's not what clients want. That's all games we play in our mind as a way of kind of dealing with the inherent uncertainty and lack of control of our professions. Yeah, when I look across the professions and ego, surgeons certainly stand out. And yet, in a way, an ego is not a bad thing in a surgeon. Because you want somebody to go in with that confidence they can do whatever they have to do and do it well. You're not looking for somebody warm and fuzzy. That might be nice and that might be the ideal person. But chances are you're looking for somebody who's so wrapped up in their ego they wouldn't dare let anything happen to you because it would reflect badly on them. Yeah, I've tried to really think in a fair way about this. Um, uh, and and just really listen openly to people when they give me examples like that. I, I taught a seminar one time where I said, you know, you want a lawyer who's present and focused and all this stuff. And a good friend of mine came up afterwards and said at a break, he said, you know, if I was charged with a crime, I would want the lawyer who is, uh, you know, self-absorbed and drunk and cheats on his wife and all of this stuff because, you know, that's my kind of guy, basically. And I thought, boy, is there any grain of truth to that? Or your example of the surgeon, somebody who's just like totally ego driven and doesn't want to make a mistake and so on. And here's what I would say. And I've actually talked with um, one of these, the head, sort of head resident of the OBGYNs, and he's, he's more enlightened on these issues. I think what it comes down to is there is plenty of room to be self-confident, focused, um, have a high degree of confidence in your skills, um, but at the same time, to be present, 
understand that you might have missed something. Remember, that if, if you have a, an authentic sense of self-confidence as a surgeon, let's say, and you're in your 40s or 50s and you're in the prime of your career and you're just really dialed in, the reason you have that is because you have spent many years learning, which means you have made some mistakes and you've learned from those mistakes. So this idea that you sort of um, spring forth uh, as, as some sort of you know, self-confident surgeon, it doesn't really work that way. If you, if you get to a point where you're highly confident in your, in your skills, that's great. But I have seen, certainly I've seen lawyers who you know, think they've gotten to that stage of, I've never lost a case and I'm so self-confident, and they blind themselves to the fact that this particular situation might call for a retreat, a settlement. That might be what's in the best interest of the client. So I, I think there's a potential trap to this notion of maybe you can just get so good that you can get away with being totally ego-driven. I, I um, gently and respectfully dispute that. <laughs> No, I, I think that's very fair. Um, you talk that you talk about five traps. One is the expertise trap. What is that? Yeah, so um, I, I I deal with expert witnesses, and every lawyer considers themselves to be an expert within their field. And the the problem with that is that we then confer on ourselves a sort of cloak of infallibility. And, and we tend to overestimate our own um, ability to look at all aspects of a situation. The story I tell in the book is about uh, a Japanese sailor who was called the god of operations. And in the Battle of Midway, he had everything all dialed in and he had this elaborate naval ballet uh, planned out for the Battle of Midway. But he failed to think about one thing. What happens if the Americans know we're coming? which turned out to be the case because we'd cracked their code uh, in a little basement room in Pearl Harbor. Uh, and, and so that's kind of a, uh, an archetypal case of somebody overestimating his own expertise and everybody else, you know, was very anxious to kind of buy into this. Let's just turn it over to the God of operations and he'll get us through this. Uh, everybody kind of fell into that trap with catastrophic results for, that particular fleet of the Japanese Navy for the Japanese Navy as a whole and for the Japanese country as a whole. We'd probably say that's a good thing in retrospect, but I'm just kind of focusing on the expertise aspect of it. Um, so the expertise trap is falling into this notion that if you get to a certain point of so-called expertise, you can stop learning, stop listening, stop being present because I'm just so good. I don't need that stuff. Um, you know, look at Lieutenant Colombo. You know, he never said, I'm the great Columbo. I can come in here and solve this. He was always curious. It's like, what am I missing here? You know, maybe, maybe I missed something. How did, let me look at my notes again. You know, it was always very, I think there was a fundamental humility about him that people found sort of endearing in the character, but it's also what I think of as true expertise. And it's representative of the beginner's mind, the idea that yeah, you're open yeah. to new information, new experiences and changing your point of view. Right. Right. I, I've, in my experience, when you say to a client, well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Hadn't thought of it that way before. They don't think, oh, what kind of expert are you? <laughs> what they really think is, you know, you're a real expert because that's, that's how expertise works. As you gather information, you change your mind as appropriate. You're truly curious. And uh, that's, that's what I aspire to. You also talk about the delayed uh, or deferred gratification trap. Excuse me. I think deferred gratification is inherent in any high achieving field. Yeah. Um, so again, I, I want to be careful not to um, be heard as saying that we should never defer our gratification. We should just live for the day and so on. Um, that's that's not healthy. It's not realistic. Um, but what I um, what I urge for law students that I talk to, for example, is um, it's, it's fine to say that you need to practice now and learn in order to set yourself up for having a good legal career. That's great. But I want you to think about starting to really embrace and enjoy and experience your life 
at a very deep level now, rather than thinking that at some future point, when you have accomplished all these things in the outer world, you'll have a different relationship with yourself then than you do now. Because what I see constantly with professionals is they become very successful and the outer world looks great and their relationship with themselves is the same. Namely, um, I'm not there yet. I will be happy when I um, make law review, get a good job, make partner, win this case, make X amount of money, whatever it might be. It's all You're always looking at what I do call the receding horizon. Um, and my message is, at some point, you're going to have to say, this is basically the relationship I'm going to have with myself, whatever the outer circumstances are, and it would be healthier and better for me and those around me if I could learn to embrace that and enjoy it for what it is, as opposed to saying it's going to be fundamentally different when outer circumstances change, because studies have shown that's not true. That when our outer circumstances change, for better or for worse, we quickly revert to where we were before. It's called hedonic reversion. And when people have catastrophic accidents and they find themselves paraplegics and in a wheelchair, after a year or two, they're basically as happy as they were before. Same thing with lottery winners on the other side. All these stories of people who win the lottery and blow it all, or you know, even if they don't go through all the money, they're not super happy in a way that they weren't before. So it all comes down to kind of how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to our immediate environment, and not looking to the future to fundamentally change that. How does that differ from an expectation trap? The the expectation trap um, is is related um, to deferred gratification and is basically saying, I'll be happy when some specific thing happens in the future. And then we get very attached to that. Um, We say, you know, I'll be, I'll be happy when I win this case. Lawyers do that all the time. Um, And I found, well, that's not really true. We just get to find another case to be attached to. Um, So that's item one. It is a, a way of kind of deferring your gratification in a way that's ultimately futile and unsuccessful. Um, But second, attachment relates closely to the idea of control. I point out um, in chapter six, which is all about control and it's been reprinted um, uh, as sort of a standalone piece. We, we are taught to believe that we can be in absolute control of things and a sense of attachment to outcomes is a, an outgrowth of that. If I just keep everything under control and do everything right, this is, this will be the outcome. And yet we all sort of know intuitively, we're not really in control of what other people do, what they think, what they decide, other outer circumstances. So how do we relate to um, that reality, which we all sort of understand intuitively? And I suggest that the way to do that is to be as unattached as possible. And I give a specific example. A woman came to me and wanted me to try a jury trial in seven weeks because she'd fired her previous lawyer. And she said, you're, I've heard you're this great storyteller and that's what I need. I need you to tell my story. And I wanted to be very clear with her up front about what I could and could not promise. And I said to her, I I will be devoted to this case. I'll give it my all. I'll do my best, but I cannot promise that I'm going to win this case for you. I want you to be very clear about that. Um, it ended up that I, I did. I got an unusually positive result, but I never attached myself to that. And I didn't, I did my best to not attach her to it. Um, and and I, that's something I think most clients are mature enough to understand that as opposed to you go to a lawyer and they say, we can't lose. And, you know, I'll, I'll win this for sure. I would hope that most clients would understand that's not something that a good lawyer can really promise. Your life has led to a great deal of wisdom. Um, if you could rewrite your story, would you? Boy, oh boy, what a great question. And I really, I really thought about that. Um, there's a great line in American Graffiti where the character Toad is talking to this 
you know, woman that he's just had this wild night with. And he says to her, maybe we could go out on a, on a date again. And next time we could avoid all the fun. <laughs> because <laughs> so he, got, he got beat up and drunk and all this stuff. So could I go through my life and like avoid all the, all the fun and all of the, you know, mistakes and everything. And so number one, it doesn't work that way. So it's important to kind of understand that for whatever reason and what whatever one's kind of understanding of life is, we know it, it doesn't work that way. If magically I could go back and, and quote, change things, um, I, I honestly don't believe I would because I'm contented with my life now. And that's all a product of everything that's gone before. So, you know, my first marriage didn't last and there were some issues there and so on. She's a good person. And I, I, I'm very careful in the book to not uh, you know, say anything unfair or negative about her, but it didn't work. So, you know, should should I have should I've gotten married? Well, I've got these three beautiful daughters, and I learned some things about myself that I just I really needed to learn uh, as a consequence of you know doing couples therapy and individual therapy and so on. So, I, I I'm grateful for the lessons I've learned. Those came from some of the quote mistakes I made. So I honestly don't think I'd go back and change things. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll support this podcast by becoming a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. It's your support that makes this podcast and website possible. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path. Because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.